So our speaker for, for this afternoon is uh, Dr. Richard Mimo. Uh, so Dr. Mimo completed his medical degree at uh, McGill University in 1982. Uh, he went then on to do uh, an internship at the Wellesley Hospital in, in Toronto, followed by a, a general surgery residency in Ottawa and then a two-year uh, transplant fellowship at the University Hospital in London, Ontario. Um, and in 1989, he returned to the Ottawa, to the Ottawa Hospital where he uh, started a practice of general and hepatobiliary surgery. And uh, he practiced for 27 years, during which time he was closely involved with the residency training program and undergraduate education. He was also peer assessor for the, Colle uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and volunteered in third world surgery and surgical education. He joined the CMPA as a physician advisor in 2017. So thanks Dr. Mio for being here. Thank you very much. So uh, thank, thank you very much for asking to, whoa, the CMPA to come and speak with uh, or, or share some information with you today. Um, the, um, as an employee of the CMP, I have to tell you, first of all, I, I don't have any conflict of interest. Sadly, throughout my entire career, I never had one. I would have loved to have one to declare, but <laughs> never came to be. I also apologize for being overdressed. Um, I would take my jacket off, but since I only ironed the front of the shirt this morning, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry if it's too cold. <laughs> so, um, uh, the organizers asked me to uh, come in and talk a little bit about the medical legal uh, issues around conscientious objection, um, which I found very challenging as a surgeon because it's a very complicated, and in fact it's not a complicated, it's really a complex issue, this issue of conscientious objection. And it'd be very easy uh, for me and for all of us to go down and get lost in the weeds of ethics and morality and conscience. And I just want to tell you that we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm always going to retract back to the law. And the CMPA is not uh, an organization that uh, plays any role in setting ethics for the profession or the uh, college policies or the laws. Uh, the CMPA is basically there to tell us, well, these are the laws, these are the policies, these are the ethical principles that are applied. How do we practice safely within the context of those, uh, those rules? Whoops, yeah. learn how to press the right button. So our objectives for this are pretty simple, really, and I just want to talk about conscientious objection and the law. Now, um, and maybe some of you know of a better, more recent survey, but the, the most recent survey I could find about doctors' attitudes towards, um, towards medical assistance in dying was the 2016 survey of the CMA. And, and in that survey, about 60% of doctors said, they would not participate or they would not provide MAID. And when they asked the, that, that subgroup that wouldn't provide MAID uh, and asked them, well, would you be comfortable referring a physician or a patient for medical assistance in dying, about 40% of them uh, felt that they would fall into that category. So still a reasonable number of physicians that were willing to refer patients for medical assistance in dying. When we look at public surveys, and there are a lot of those, the public surveys are really anywhere from 75 to almost 90% of the population, depending what the surveys or, or who's actually surveyed, uh, support the concept of physician-assisted death. I mean, those are numbers that, you know, Justin Trudeau would love today, right? Uh, 75, 85% approval. Um, and in fact, many patients have already availed themselves of the service, and, and I think now it's up to somewhere in the vicinity of almost 4,000 uh, that, um, that have at least made the request for, uh, for MAID. So I think from the, the society, from Canadian society point of view, uh, it certainly uh, does not appear that Canadian society sees uh, medical assistance in dying as some sort of a marginal therapy, some kind of quack therapy that's you know, gonna be here for a little while and disappear, I think. From a societal point of view, it looks like something that's here and here to stay. Uh, so I think the conscientious objection thing will probably uh, continue to be a thorn in the side for a long time. 
Now, where does the problem come from? Well, the, the problem actually starts with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court recognized that uh, in the Carter decision that uh, patients had a right uh, to access medical assistance in dying under certain circumstances. But they also recognized that we as physicians uh, had the right to respect our conscience and we shouldn't be compelled to provide MAID. And then uh, the federal bill that came out of that Supreme Court decision basically said the same thing. It clarified a little bit the uh, eligibility criteria and what the safeguards were, uh, but also said, yes, if as a physician you have personal convictions that would prevent you from uh, giving MAID uh, or participating in the process, we need to respect that. And that's really created uh, essentially two very strongly held ethical positions uh, with not a lot of negotiation space in between. Uh, from the patient's point of view, we're talking about respecting patient autonomy uh, and their right to make a decision, uh, but also, and perhaps more importantly, their right to, to access health care. Um, and again, not health care that's seen as a fringe or marginal thing, uh, something that from a societal point of view seems reasonably accepted. And then on the other side of the divide are us, the physicians, with our right um, uh, to object to giving that kind of treatment. And if we, and both sides actually have a reasonably solid ethical argument for their position. So it's not like one side is right and the other side is wrong. They both have very good ethical arguments. And so that makes it even more difficult to find that middle ground. Now, if we take just the physician's side and say, well, we're just going to respect the physician's rights, then the problem that arises is there's a loss of patient autonomy, and there's also a patient's right of access to care. And I, I think the right of access to care is probably the one that bothers the patients the most, to say, well, this is a service that's available and that you know, the Supreme Court says it's okay, I want it. That seems to be the biggest stumbling block for the public. And at the other extreme, if we just listen to the patient's rights and say, well, the doctor's rights, they're not so important, uh, then obviously abandoning our conscience has some implications in terms of our integrity, uh, our loss of self-image, uh, depression, burnout, loss of joy at work, maybe even decide to change profession or drop medicine altogether. So clearly not a good result, either for us or for society. Uh, losing physicians is not a good idea. Or even having unmotivated or uh, burnt out physicians is not particularly good either. Now we've, we've had many ethical dilemmas of that sort in medicine. Um, and that you can think of, uh, you know, the situations where uh, we think uh, care is futile, yet a patient or a patient's family still wants care. And in many of those situations, we've turned to the courts and said, well, okay, you know, you guys make the law, help us here. Uh, how do we find a middle ground? And the courts have been actually fairly consistent in telling us, well, there isn't usually a legal solution to an ethical dilemma. Uh, what there is, is a practical solution that allows you to find that middle ground um, and that usually involves compromising one or the other side. Now, if you asked me, uh, all right, can you give us a few examples of issues around MAID and conscientious objection at the CMPA? The answer is there are none, actually. There's no jurisprudence. Uh, so, do we have a case where a physician who is a conscientious objector says, no, I'm not going to refer you to for MAID, and that patient lodges a complaint or a uh, lawsuit? The answer is those cases don't exist, or at least don't exist yet. Uh, so we can't use jurisprudence to try and say, well, this is what's going to happen in the future. What we can do, though, is we can look a little bit backwards. Um, and when I asked the lawyers, I said, well, what am I going to tell these people? Uh, they said, well, what you can look at is what were the decisions that have been made in the context of conscientious objection other than made. And the examples here uh, that I chose were termination of pregnancy, so uh, abortion and contraception. And um, in those situations, all of which have been uh, before the courts previously, uh, the courts basically have tended to have unfavorable decisions vis-a-vis -a, -vis a conscientious objector. And the courts have basically said, 
you know, if you are going to interfere with the patient's ability to access a service, that's a recognized service, a healthcare service, uh, or if you uh, try and unduly influence them with your beliefs or judgment, uh, the, the courts will generally find it against you. So what the courts have said, and it's important, the, the courts haven't said our rights are meaningless. What they have said is that when there's a conflict between physician rights and our rights, they're going to look at who is the most inconvenienced by the conflict. And that's how the courts really have come uh, to make their decisions. They say, well, you know, in this particular conflict, because the patient's in a more vulnerable position, because they have a right of access to this, that you as a physician are going to be, or, or that the physician will be less inconvenienced by the compromise than the patient will be. The second thing that they usually invoke is that we as physicians have a uh, professional obligation to put the patient's interests ahead of ours. Uh, and again, that falls into this category. Now, when the Supreme Court uh, handed down the Carter decision and when the federal bill was created, they didn't talk anything about conscientious objection. It's not mentioned anywhere. They decided to not even broach the subject at all. And they left that up to the provinces uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and specifically the colleges. And uh, what have the colleges done? Well, have the colleges tried to find a middle ground? Um, and again, speaking from a, a legal point of view and just going to represent the college's point of view for a second, and remember, I'm a messenger here. <laughs> I'm not the college. <laughs> um, uh, from the college's point of view, we'll use Ontario as an example. And uh, in Ontario, the uh, Ontario College policy states very clearly that uh, the college recognizes that physicians have a right to be a conscientious objector uh, and that they don't have to provide MAID if they don't want to. Um, and they go on to say, and uh, you know, MAID is never an emergency, so you can never be in a position where something is so emergent that you, you're just going to have to do it. So it's clear you don't have to do it. However, and the sentence that many of us don't like is that they, they go on to state that an effective referral must be provided. But they also tell us that they do not consider that providing an effective referral is the same thing as assisting or, or assisting, providing assistance in uh, uh, dying. So basically they're saying a referral is putting a sufficient degree of separation between um, the referral and the, or between seeing the patient and the patient having medically assisted death, that they consider that adequate in terms of, um, of a degree of separation. The Ministry of Health took it a little bit further and said, okay, we're also going to create this centralized service, a care coordination service, and the physician can simply refer the patient to the care coordination service. The care coordination service will evaluate the patient, determine if they're a candidate. If they're a candidate and they still want to consider MAID, uh, the physicians will be there to take care of them. Uh, and this service can actually be accessed directly by the patients or families. Um, and, um, and so that seemed to solve the problem, except that you could still have the situation where a patient would come to see you uh, as a physician, uh, not be aware of the service, and say, I'm interested in MAID, what do I do? And you would still be in a position where uh, you would have to refer, based on the policy, you would still have to refer to this co uh, care coordination service. Uh, the, the question, for those of you who didn't hear it, is you can refer them by just saying it verbally to the patient. Um, the college hasn't been very explicit about that. Um, the, the, they still use the term effective referral so if you just told the patient about it and the patient went and contacted themselves, uh, well, first of all, it's very unlikely that the patient would ever complain in that situation. So I, I don't think it would be an issue. But if for whatever reason they did complain, could the college say, no, that's not an effective referral, potentially. But again, are, is there any kind of experience with that? There isn't at all. So, um, so who knows? But for many conscientious objectors, that's still not a sufficient degree of separation, right? 
So the, and I'm sure you all know this, the uh, Christian Medical and Dental Society of Canada decided to challenge the uh, college policy and say, no, this goes against our religious freedom or our free freedom of religious expression. And uh, we think the Ontario policy should be taken down. It needs to change. And the court handed down its decision just this past uh, end of January or early February. And basically, the divisional court, and this was a, a unanimous uh, opinion of three judges, was that they said the requirements impair the individual applicant's right of religious freedom, so the physician, as little as reasonably possible in order to achieve the goal. The alternatives proposed by the applicants would compromise the goal of ensuring access to health care in many situations, often involving vulnerable members of our society at the time of requesting medical services. So really a decision that is essentially identical to what we've seen with conscientious objection before, which is we're going to balance the rights of the physician, the rights of the uh, patient, and we're going to see who's the most inconvenienced by this, uh, and if the vulnerable party, which is the patient, is more inconvenienced, then yes, we are going to step on the rights of the physician a little bit to do that. And uh, from the court's point of view, this was, a, was doing it in as gentle a, po a way as possible. Now, that decision is being appealed. Uh, they, the court has met, but they haven't handed their decision down yet. When I was speaking with our lawyers, they said it is highly unlikely that the Court of Appeal is going to change the divisional court's uh, decision or send it back to them. Um, and they felt it was also likely that in that instance, this will probably go be appealed to the Supreme Court. So who knows? We'll see what happens down the road. But for now, at least in Ontario, that judgment stands. Now what about in the rest of Canada? I should say, if at any point you want to uh, stop me or you have something to say, uh, rather than save it for the end, um, if we can get some discussion going, just holler. So what about in the rest of Canada? Well, in the rest of Canada, if you look across, there, there's some kind of form of a care coordination service in many of the provinces, uh, meaning some kind of a centralized service uh, that you can call and refer a patient uh, for made. Now, in Ontario and Nova Scotia are the only two that explicitly say that the physician has an obligation to make an effective referral to either another physician or to this um, uh, coordinated care service. Now, um, if you are a conscientious objector and you have to work in Canada, which is the best province? Which province has the best policy? Which one would suit you the best? I know it's none of them. Manitoba. Manitoba. Manitoba? Okay. Manitoba has the best conscientious objection by the provincial number. That's my Okay. You picked the wrong one. <laughs> so my conversations with most conscientious objectors told me it's Alberta. And I asked, well, why Alberta? And they said, well, in Alberta they have this Care coordination service, it's very mature, it's been very well advertised, the public knows about it, um, and it seems to be uh, more likely to be the default that the patient's actually going to go to the care coordination service rather than even broach the topic uh, with a physician who's a, um, who's a uh, conscientious objector. Um, and so, uh, so I asked our lawyers, I said, okay, so in Alberta then, if I'm a family doctor and I'm a conscientious objector, and let's say I get a patient who, they, we live in northern Alberta, and they don't really know about this care coordination service. They come and see me and say, I want uh, medical assistance in dying. And I say, uh, yeah, I don't do that. You, you'll have to figure it out on your own. Uh, it's available, just go research it a little bit. Uh, and the patient complained, what would happen? So the lawyers told me, well, you have to look at the policy. And if you look at the policy, uh, the policy is clear that, um, th about the requirement for ensuring that they have access to it. But if you're a conscientious objector, you still, the policy is also quite clear that you must ensure that reasonable access to the Alberta Health Services Medical Assistance and Dying Care Coordination Service is provided to the patient without delay. So, 
the answer to that is that if that situation arose, the decision of the college in Alberta would probably be very similar to the decision of the college in any of the provinces, including Ontario, which is to find against the physician because they would be going against the policy uh, as it's stated. Now, um, there was a recent article in the CMAJ Open by uh, Dr. Kelsall, and one of the paragraphs, uh, this was just last month, one of the paragraphs said, some provinces have made strong provisions for conscientious objection. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia's policy upholds that the same tenets of professionalism as the Ontario and Nova Scotia colleges, but goes on to state explicitly that physicians are not required to make a formal referral on behalf of the patient. And she's right. Uh, I, I called up the lawyer and I said, no, you, actually, BC says you don't have to. Uh, and he says, go back and read the policy. And it does say in the policy that a physician is not required to make a formal referral on behalf of the patient. But you have to read the whole policy. And if you read the whole policy, it's again fairly clear. Physicians who object to MAID on the basis of their values and beliefs are required to provide an effective transfer uh, of care to, for their patients by advising patients that other physicians may be available to see them, suggesting the patient visit an alternate physician, and blah, blah, blah. And that physicians must practice within the confines of the legal system, which is the same as saying you have still that obligation to ensure that the patient gets the information, has access, um, so that even though you might see this one statement and think, oh, you know, this, this is okay then, I don't have to make an effective referral. Um, you don't have to make an effective referral in the sense of Ontario and Nova Scotia. But if that degree of separation of having to give the information to the patient so that they know how to access uh, the service is still inadequate to you, then BC has the same rules. Now, I don't have an excerpt from Manitoba, but I will tell you that if you go across the country uh, and scour the policies and read them carefully, every province still has that requirement that you make, that you cannot interfere with the patient's access, that you have to facilitate their access. So you can't not tell them about something that exists. In Manitoba, uh, the centralized or the care coordination started out as a kind of a little fragmented system as I understand it and it's become a very well publicized just like in Alberta um, but the requirement would still be the same if you were faced with a patient and the patient had no idea about the care coordination service and asked you about it and you didn't bring it up and the patient suffered as a result of it, or felt they had suffered as a result of it, and complained, the Manitoba College would likely come to the exact same conclusion. Again, do we have any examples? No, because there haven't been any college complaints specifically in that area in any of the provinces across Canada, at least none that the CMPA is aware of, none that any members have called about. So in terms of the law, it seems very likely that no matter where you work in Canada, and no matter the change in the, the, the actual words and finesse of the language, that the spirit of the law, you know, what, what's intended by the policies in the law, seems to be very similar from province to province. So what can you do as a conscientious objector to reduce your risk? Um, The CMPA's advice is, first of all, that you inform your patients. I mean, if patients know ahead of time that you, have, that you are a conscientious objector, um, they will very likely, in combination with some of the other suggestions, be less likely to make that request of you. In terms of informing your patient, you also don't want to be judgmental or impose your beliefs in the process. So the whole idea here is that if you look at probably the single biggest predictor of college complaints and uh, medical legal action, it's a um, failure of the doctor-patient relationship. So when you have a good trust relationship between patient and doctor, uh, and I'm sure many of you have had the experience, I as a surgeon have had it way too many times, where disastrous things have happened, 
but you have a superb relationship with that patient. They trust you, you trust them. There are no complaints that come out of that, even though the results have been very poor. And I think this one, to me, is probably very central. So if you're a conscientious objector and your patients know about it, you've got signs, whatever, you're not judgmental, you're not trying to share your beliefs with them, and you have a good, solid doctor-patient relationship <laughs> with them, it is very unlikely uh, that that patient is going to complain. The third part of that, obviously, is if you have that good doctor-patient relationship, you're not going to abandon your patient. If your patient says, you know, I'm interested in MAID, and they're going to end up going to see somebody else for MAID, uh, if you have that solid relationship, they're probably going to continue to see you for ongoing care. And, and if they do, you should continue to take care of them, again, to preserve that doctor-patient relationship. <clears throat> 